In any free country, a policeman uh, is supposed to enforce the law, and the law protects the guilty as well as the innocent. Our job is tough enough. It's supposed to be. It has to be tough. A policeman's job is only easy in a police state. That's the whole point, Captain. Who is the boss, the cop or the law? Charlton Heston stars as a principled Mexican prosecutor facing down a corrupt American cop, played with growling intensity by Orson Welles, in Touch of Evil the dark, disturbing, twisty-turny 1958 film noir that Wells not only co-starred in, but also directed. I'm Bill Newcott, film critic for the Saturday Evening Post, tracing the tragedy and triumph of a mistreated masterpiece on movies for the rest of us. Well, they're pigeon in their nest. Pigeon, eh? As Touch of Evil comes to home video in a sparkling new 4K Ultra HD edition, the film remains a classic cautionary tale of what can happen when a movie maker loses control of their work, and a triumphant tale of how sometimes those injustices can be rectified with astonishing results. Before the cameras began to roll, Touch of Evil was a masterpiece on paper. It boasted an all-star cast, including Heston, Wells, Janet Lee, Marlena Dietrich. Come on, read my future for me. You haven't got any. Joseph Cotton, Mercedes McCambridge, and even Zsa Zsa Gabor. Your future is all used up. The script, a gleeful masterclass in misdirection and profound social commentary, was co-written by Wells. Why don't you go home? It's ironic that people often say, well, Wells' direction of Touch of Evil is amazing. Too bad he was stuck with Charlton Heston playing a Hispanic prosecutor. But the truth of the matter is, Heston was already cast in the lead role, and Wells was set to play the corrupt cop when Heston suggested that Wells should direct the film as well. He's pretty good, Heston said, which would have been the understatement of the cinematic century. But Wells had a problem in Hollywood. He never recovered from his reputation as a hard-headed perfectionist who defied studio heads at every turn. Rosebud. Everyone knows his first movie, Citizen Kane, still ranked at or near the top of every best picture ever made list, was a financial failure. George Amberson Minifer, the major's one grandchild, was a princely terror. Hey! Why, golly, I guess you think you own this town. His second film, The Magnificent Ambersons, was by most accounts originally even more compelling than Kane, but the studio seized the final version, recut it, and even filmed a happier ending, and then blamed the box office failure on the director. What? His comeuppance. Something's bound to take him down someday. Wells, who was already collaborating on a rewrite of the original Touch of Evil script, made two promises. He would bring the film in on budget, and he would deliver it on schedule. For Wells, Touch of Evil turned out to be a trifecta win for writing, acting, and directing. His version of the script moved the story away from San Diego to a pair of run-down border towns straddling the U.S.-Mexico border. My friend Vargas has some very special ideas about police procedure. He seems to think it don't matter whether a killer's hanged or not so long as we obey the fine well, print. Captain, rule. Directing himself as the rotund, unshaven, muttering police captain Hank Quinlan, Wells created a character of unmatched sleaziness, of relentlessly unrepentant corruption. Still, like most real-life villains, Quinlan doesn't see himself as a bad guy at all. Yes, he admits he plants evidence on suspects, but as he says, only on the guilty ones. What? Vargas' wife? An narcotic shrimp? He hired cinematographer Russell Meddy, one of Hollywood's most prolific film noir cameramen who knew how to cast shadows and make shadows part of his cast. Two years later, Meddy would win an Oscar for Spartacus, having been hired by director Stanley Kubrick, largely on the strength of his work on Touch of Evil. <laughs> Meddy was just the guy to accomplish the two astonishing tracking shots that helped make Touch of Evil so compelling. First is the breathtaking opening sequence, which begins with a close-up of a bomb being planted in a car trunk. Without making a single cut, Wells and Meddy lift their camera high into the air, over the buildings of a decaying downtown, following the car as it weaves its way through the crowded streets. It's all very showy and cinematic, but a few minutes later, Wells accomplishes one of the most marvelously realized scenes in film history. Remember. I'll do all the talking. Here are eight people in a two-room apartment, all of them talking, all of them telling the audience a little bit about themselves through their words and actions, sometimes simultaneously. 
for five minutes, Wells keeps his camera rolling, moving from room to room, person to person. The characters move in and out of the frame, intricately choreographed in both their own positions and their shifts from shadow into light. Wells reveals a major plot point as an empty shoebox falls into the tub. In these five minutes, we learn who are the bad guys, who are the good guys, who are the opportunists, and who the fall guy is going to be. It's a movie within a movie, a short film about power and powerlessness. And it all belongs to cinema's hallowed trinity. Wells the actor, Wells the writer, and Wells the director. Intuition? Why not? Quinlan doesn't have a monopoly on hunches. Wells kept his promise about finishing the film on time and under budget, but he was still being punished for his alleged sins of previous excess. He was not given final cut of the film. Wells' footage was handed over to rank-and-file studio film cutters who made such a mash of Wells' work, the studio commissioned a second director to film additional scenes in order to clarify parts of the film that they, in their own humble opinions, thought were too hard to follow. Heston and Lee at first refused to participate in the reshoots until studio lawyers pointed out they were contractually required to. Heston, who kept a daily journal, wrote after the reshoot, I have done worse work in the movies than this day's retakes, but I don't remember feeling worse. At least, he wrote, he talked the new director out of at least one change, although he never said what that change was. Starring this outstanding cast, Charlton Heston, Janet Lee. I could love being my husband will only cooperate. As a courtesy, the studio showed the cut to Wells, who responded with a detailed 58-page memo, explaining why certain scenes should stay the way they were and what he was trying to accomplish in Touch of Evil beyond the storyline. Only the offbeat, original, creative powers of Orson Welles could bring you so suspenseful, so gripping, so different a drama of love threatened by vengeance. His comments fell on deaf ears. With nearly 15 minutes subtracted from even the version Wells had seen, Touch of Evil was dumped onto a double bill and promptly forgotten by the studio. But even in its savage state, the brilliance of Wells' film could not be utterly extinguished. Against the studio's wishes, the film was entered into competition at the 1958 Brussels World's Fair Film Festival, where Touch of Evil won first prize and Wells was honored as best director. Mr. Bell, this would be my first question. If it really is true that this time on the festival, you saw your, fi your picture really for the first time. It is true, yes. Uh, could you tell us why? Well, because the completion of the montage of the film was uh, accomplished by the studio and by myself. Gamely, Wells attended the event, even though he had never even seen the edited version shown in Brussels. In a television interview, he hinted at his disappointment at the final cut, which must have sounded very strange indeed to the people who had just presented him and the film with their highest awards. I must say it's not too far from what I wanted. Mm -hmm. It's not too different. Mm -hmm. That's the best thing. The shortened Touch of Evil became a late-night TV staple, appreciated but seldom loved. By the time Wells died in 1985, Universal Studios had located a copy of the first cut, restoring 15 minutes, yet still ignoring the contents of Wells' 58-page memo, which by then had become must-reading for Orson Welles fans. Finally, in 1998, Walter Murch, the man who had edited the Godfather films, took Wells' 58-page memo in one hand, all the available footage from Universal's vaults in the other, and reconstructed Wells' version. He restored Wells' innovative cross-cutting between plot lines that the studio had found so confusing in 1958. He tweaked the sound to match Wells' nuanced approach. And most noticeably, he removed Henry Mancini's music from the opening sequence, returning to the nerve-jangling ambient street sounds that helped make the scene so suspenseful. Murcher's restoration is one of the great triumphs of film preservation, and now Touch of Evil looks and sounds even better than ever thanks to a new 4K Ultra HD release from Kino Lorber. Even better, the new set includes all three versions of Touch of Evil, the preview version that is most likely the one Wells first saw, the cannibalized 96-minute version that nevertheless won top prizes at Brussels, and Murch's 111-minute reconstruction. You can pre-order the new 3-disc Touch of Evil 4K Ultra HD set at klstudioclassics.com, plus Blu-ray and DVD versions of the Merch cut are still available at amazon.com. 
Those first two are fine for hardcore cinema buffs, but do yourself a favor, skip right to the version inspired by Wells' memo. Yeah, you already knew Wells was a genius, but here is proof that genius isn't just smart, it can be terrific fun too. I'm Bill Newcott.